Working Cows Podcast, Episode 41. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hey everybody, my guest today on the Working Cows Podcast is Dave Pratt. Dave is the owner of Ranch Management Consultants, the company that puts on the Ranching for Profit School and the Executive Link program and some other new programs that we're going to talk with Dave about during this episode. But first and foremost, I wanted to say uh, sorry about the audio quality in the last couple episodes. I realized there were some parts that were probably hard to hear, but I have a contingency plan in place and I'm ready to uh, continue to improve in this podcasting journey as I approach 50 episodes. Uh, speaking of which, very exciting guest I have locked down for episode 50, so I'm excited about that and I think you will be as well. I uh, look forward to passing that milestone and I thank you guys for joining me on this journey. I also wanted to uh, follow up last week's episode. One of the things that uh, Luke Perman said was that you should listen to every episode I have produced. And so over this last week, something that's been on my to-do list since I launched this podcast, I went ahead and finally finished up that thing, which was listing every episode on one single page. So if you go to workingcows.net slash episodes, you can find the entire backlog of episodes with a link to each episode and a little title about what it's about. So workingcows.net slash episodes will contain all of the episodes from here on out and every previous episode all on one page. So you don't have to scroll through a bunch of pages, 10 episodes at a time or so. So workingcows.net slash episodes and you can find every single episode of the Working Cows po- podcast on one page. But without any further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Dave Pratt to the show. Dave, thanks for joining me on the Working Cows podcast. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Uh, we have sat down in the past and talked a little bit about the issue of customer value and how we can uh, consider what value we are creating for customers in our ranching businesses and the importance of all that. If people are interested in checking that out, they can go to workingcows.net slash 13 to catch up on that. And then we're going to move forward into the core val or the core principles of a ranch business and how do we determine those and what are some of the things that kind of guide uh, the formation of our core principles. So let's start off with just kind of... Okay. A lot of people think of this as just touchy-feely mumbo-jumbo, so to speak. Um, And I think companies like Enron that had a really pretty sounding mission statement uh, add fuel to that fire. But properly developed and used core principles really do provide a compass for the company, a a guiding set of of rules. Uh, You'll hear a lot of people talk about core values. I mean, values are things like integrity and honesty and things like that. And, and those are great. But the real question is, what's the action? What's the act through which you apply that value? And that's what turns it into a principle. Uh, somebody can say, well, we value honesty. Yeah, okay. Uh, under what circumstances might you deviate from that rule? You know, do these pants make me look fat, dear? No, the pants don't make you look fat. Uh, you know what, there are times when we might, from a standpoint of self-preservation, deviate from the rule of 100% honesty in all circumstances, but um, complete transparency in all of our transactions, well, that's a, that's a principle. That, that explains the action uh, 
that whatever the core value was, that the core, that explains the action that you're going to take as a result of that. And so that's a core principle. Um, and so that's that's essentially it. And it's partly to get everybody in the business on the same page about what you all stand for. And 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 these aren't just things that are because they're convenient or it's the idea of the day. These are principles that are enduring and that uh, if you ever failed to live up to one of these principles, you'd seriously question whether you really ought to be in business or not. Similar to the, the customer value, if I fail to deliver on that promise that I'm making to you, there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out of business, basically. Yep. Are there some commonalities as far as core principles are concerned that you've seen as people have worked through that process of developing them? Yeah, I think there are until people take it seriously. You know, at a superficial level, most of us share the same core principles. You know, honesty, um, hard work, you know, the, the, these kinds of things. But when you dig deeper and deeper, you know, why is that important to us? Under what circumstances uh, would we deviate from that? How would we uh, apply this? When a person really takes it seriously and starts digging deeper, that's where you start to see some uniqueness in these things. And what are some of the processes that people can go through to to get to those core principles? We have them start by identifying values. And each person, and I'm a big believer in post-it notes. If I had been smart way back when, I would have bought stock in 3M uh, because I plow through about a zillion post-it notes a year. But uh, what we have people do is have the family sit together or the members of the, of the team sit together. And each person on a set of post-it notes will write one idea on a post-it. And at least two or three, and maybe as many as seven or eight, a person could very easily argue that once you have more than three core principles, they aren't really core anymore. You know, the more you have, it seems like the more diluted they become. So, but when you're first establishing this, you're casting a broader net. So a person could come up with a half a dozen things or eight things. And at this point, I don't care if it's the action, it's just the value, you know, um, uh, sustainability, um, uh, building healthy soils, whatever the value is that uh, you think is important. Uh, then one by one, we usually start with the youngest person in a group. They'll post one of the things they had and explain why it's important to them. And then the next person uh, puts their thing on a flip chart and explains why that's important. And you keep going around. Even if there's duplication, that's fine. It just shows there's some common ground. And once you have all those things up there, you start looking for some commonalities. And you'll group the things that are uh, very similar together. You don't want to just, you know, if they just have to do with ecology, but maybe one is about... Uh, thriving wildlife populations, and one might be about building healthy soils, I would tend to keep those two things distinct. But if there's some obvious similarities, uh, then, you know, just two different ways of phrasing the same thing, then you might put those together. And then the discussion goes about which of these, you know, what are the actions that these, these values would lead to, and which of these things are m most important to us, and, w w and that we would under no circumstance ever deviate from. And that's the discussion that happens, and you drill it down usually to two or three, certainly no more than five. We usually try to come up with a short, succinct phrase of how what the implementation looks like, and that's, uh, that's all there is to it. And are those, um, are they single words, or are they, they words worked into a phrase, or are they individual phrases for each value? The values can be individual words. Uh, they often are individual words or, or maybe sets of two words. But the principles are going to be uh, phrases or sentences, usually complete sentences. And do you usually recommend that there's a third party involved in this process of finding these core values or core principles? I don't think it's necessary. If, uh, if there's disagreement among owners at a deep level and people have a hard time discussing things, then this is not the place to begin. Uh, there are other issues that have to be dealt with. Owners need to be able to talk to one another uh, about 
important and difficult issues. There's a quote that I like to use at the schools uh, by a fellow named Doug Floyd, and he says, you don't get harmony when everyone sings the same note. We tend to be afraid of disagreement in family businesses. We tend to be afraid of any kind of conflict anywhere. I mean, if you look, whether it's socially, uh, politically, we hang out with people who agree with us. So we'd like to think that we're open-minded people, open to all sorts of points of view. But the fact is, we tend to only look for and accept information that already reinforces uh, what our current thinking is. And when we hang out with folks like that without exposing ourselves to challenges, it, we get in the habit of, or we, I think to a large degree, we've lost the skill of knowing how to disagree effectively. Uh, there's, there is such a thing as constructive disagreement. But if you and I are business partners and we come to the table completely like-minded on something, then one of us isn't necessary. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that disagreement that will lead to better decisions and better implementation. Well, I don't like that idea because it won't do this and you've forgotten about that and I'm worried about this. Okay, well, now we have some things to address to make it a better decision. And there are processes that, you know, it's one of the things. Nobody has ever taught us how to talk to one another. And, and maybe more important, nobody's ever shown us how to listen to one another. And there are processes that we use at the school to teach people how to do that. Uh, sure. you know, the worst thing in the world is for Junior to go to the school and come home. And sometimes it's not Junior. Sometimes it's Dad um, to come home and everybody thinks they've come back from Mars. You know, they've got this idea <laughs> to, to revolutionize the place um, or at least make some significant changes. And nobody has a clue as to what they're talking about. And, of course, change to most people is scary. Although I, it's interesting. I read something the other day. It said change isn't. Uh, change isn't difficult or change isn't scary. It's resistance to change. That's no, that, I'm sorry. The way it went was change isn't stressful. Resistance to change is stressful. <laughs> um, and of course, resistance to change is, is appropriate. You know, it's a defensive thing. We don't want to go off half cocked and make stupid decisions, but there are tools to thoroughly vet decisions. And when we reject things out of hand, uh, we miss out on some big opportunities. So, uh, that's, this is a long way of saying that if people in a business can't discuss this, then there's some deeper issues that need to be addressed before you even try to do this. One would even have to question, should they be in business together? Right. I think that this is an appropriate moment to talk about something that I heard you call horribilizing, where we <laughs> uh, <laughs> assume the worst about the other person person's motivations and that can be a real big block to effective communication yeah i can't take credit for that i read that in a book called leadership and self-deception it's uh, by an organization called the arbinger institute a fantastic uh, group of folks that do leadership training and personal development training but horribilizing is the process of telling yourself a story so for example you, you and I are partners, and we sh let's say we share an office. And one day I walk into the office, and there's a pile of your papers on my desk. All right, that's what I see. I tell myself a story about that. He doesn't respect my space. He's such a slob. He has he expect me to get my work done when he's putting his stuff all over the place. All right, so I tell myself a story, which leads me to say something kind of snipey or snarky uh, or do something. Maybe I push those papers off so they're just teetering and about to fall on the floor. And when you step in and close the door, all of a sudden, whoop, they're on the floor. Um, and then he sees or sees what I said or did, and he tells him a story. Uh, there Dave goes again. He's not, you know, he's not giving me my space or whatever. And that leads him to say or do something. And I see or say, you know, I see that and tell myself a story. So it just goes around and around and around like the, <laughs> the spiraling of a of flush in the toilet, so to speak. And what, what happens is the relationship goes down the drain as we tell ourselves these stories, horribilizing one another. Um, what we suggest people do is when they see what somebody has said or done, that they suspend the story and they tell themselves a different story. 
And the question one would ask themselves here is why would an otherwise rational person have done or said the thing that they said or did? Tell yourself that story. Well, maybe they were in a hurry and just weren't thinking. So when you approach them about it, and this isn't that you don't hold people accountable or you don't call them on their stuff, but you start with this in mind. Hey, when you left those papers on my desk, which was annoying to me, I figure it's because you were in a hurry and, and didn't have time to, to sort them out. Is that right? No, I can't stand your guts, so I was trying to annoy you, maybe, they, you know, whatever <laughs> they say. But you start off by cutting them some slack, and, you know, nobody sets out trying to be a jerk. I remember a long time ago uh, in building RMC, uh, I confided to a friend of mine when I bought it. I said, at least I bought myself a job. I bought myself a job. And at that moment, I realized that we didn't have a business. We just had a collection of assets and a bunch of jobs. And we spent the next several years transforming this into a real business. Well, during that process, I tell people you can't run a sustainable business on unsustainable effort. But sometimes it takes unsustainable effort to build one, you know, a burst of energy and activity to get over the hump. Well, I was going through that, and a friend of mine from Australia was visiting, and I was being really hard on myself. I, uh, I would never put work down. Even when I was playing catch with the kids uh, or at some event with the kids, I would, my mind was still on work. And I was uh, telling this guy, that, oh, I need to do this, and I could have done that better. And he said, no, you couldn't, Dave. You, you, you couldn't do better. You did the best you could. And I said, no, 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 I could do better. He said, no, you can't. You, you're doing as, as good as you can. And I got kind of angry about that because I'm, I'm kind of a perfectionist by nature. And I said, no, I can do better. And he said, no, David, you can't. We're all doing the best we can. And that was, that was gosh, that's like 15 years ago. And I still remember that clear as day. And that's the premise I try to approach people with. If somebody's doing something unreasonable, you know what? In that moment, given the stresses they're feeling, given the tools they know, given everything else that's gone on in their life, that's the best they could do in that moment. It might not be very good, but that's the best that they could do. And if we approach one another like that, then it, it doesn't excuse behavior, but it explains it. And it makes it a lot easier to begin conversations with your heart in the right place. You know, instead of trying to trip someone up or make them look bad, if your real intent is to come up with something that, you know, a better outcome for everybody involved, if your heart's in the right place, that, that approach will, there's a lot better chance of taking the conversation there than the way we normally approach things. So we've talked about kind of the process itself and then how do we effectively communicate who should be involved in this process in a ranch business? When in doubt, be inclusive. Certainly the ownership team. I think the management team should be there too. If it, you know, unless this is just, if you've got short-term people who are going to be blowing in and blowing out, then pretty much just the owner team. But if you have upper level management, that's an integral part of the operation, then I would definitely include them too. When you were here in Belfouche and putting on the workshop, I took some notes, and uh, I have under core principles, I have real, enduring, and actionable, and, and those are guides for how we uh, form these core principles. Could you share a little bit about, about those? I think those are pretty self-explanatory. I mean, uh, I, the real part would be, well, just because it sounds good doesn't mean it's a, <laughs> it's a real deal for you. Um, <laughs> So this is where a little soul searching, um, you know, when people are just trying to go through the exercise, sometimes they'll just come up with words that sound right or seem politically correct. Um, and if they're going to do that, they might as well not do this process at all. Um, it, it does require a little more introspection than that. Uh, enduring. We've already talked about that. These aren't fads of the day. These are things that are going to be important, whether they're convenient or not. And actionable, that's where we turn the value into a principle. I appreciate your time today. I wanted to also give you an opportunity to share about some of the new developments with ranch management consultants uh, and some of the different things that you guys are doing with the new website and some of the new initiatives that you've launched in the recent days. Yeah, we've got some cool stuff coming up. Um, one of the things we've launched uh, 
about the 1st of June, I think it is, is this program called RFP First Steps. First Steps is a limited series of short emails. There's 10 emails that come out at weekly intervals. First one actually comes out the day after somebody requests this. And each email includes links to two videos. And the first video will be me explaining one of the concepts we teach at the school, like the three secrets for increasing profit or the 80-20 rule. Uh, the 80-20 rule says that 80% of the things we do produce 20% of the result. 20% of the things we do produce 80% of the result, which means that 80% of the things we do are pretty much a waste of time. Uh, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but if we don't take that 20% of the time to work on the business, then, you know, we could do things just right working in it, but we might be doing the wrong things. And so these videos are all, each of them is about three to four minutes explaining one of those concepts. And then the second video is a graduate of the school explaining how they've applied that concept. Again, it's a, this one's between three and five minutes usually. Um, but talking about how they applied the three secrets or the 80-20 rule or used benchmarking to find a dead wood in a business. Uh, anyway, so there's 10 of these. It's a free program. Uh, we've been really, really pleased with the response to it. It's a nice way to try ranching for profit on for size without spending any money or leaving the comfort of your, your home or at least your phone. And um, so we'd encourage people to sign up for that. While they're signing up for that, they can also sign up for Profit Tips if they're not currently getting that. Profit Tips is a, a, an e-column, again, pretty short. It's usually one page that I write twice each month about some concept that we teach in the Ranching for Profit School. And then neither one of these is, uh, I guess, in, in first steps, there's usually something like, gee, don't you want to learn this concept? You should really come to the school. But 90% of the email or 90% of the video is content, not uh, arm twisting. Uh, profit tips, there's no arm twisting at all. It's just complete content from, from the school. And again, that's free. It comes out twice a month. And so we'd encourage people to go to ranchingforprofit.com and go to the link for more information. And they could sign up for either of those or an information packet. And, uh, and there's a lot of other resources there too. There's several years worth of back issues of profit tips on there. So if somebody is uh, looking for some time to kill uh, or some good bathroom reading, there it is. And uh, what about RFP Next Steps? Is that that's up and running as well it, from the looks of it? RFP Next Steps is un, up and running. It's still under development. It consists of four parts. The first part is uh, creating a baseline for your business and reporting against that baseline. And this is a way of... You know, I have a lot, we have a lot of people come through the school who make a lot of changes and they'll say things. Well, the simplest, simplest example is with the help of the pastors. They'll say, gee, Dave, I'm seeing these plants that I never saw here before. But the question is, did they ever look before? You know, they may have been there, but they're just looking at their pasture with a different eye now than they used to. So to really know if things are changing, you have to document the way things are. So whether it's personally or the effectiveness of the business team or ecologically, or the infrastructure, or the effectiveness and profitability of enterprises, or the profitability of the business, or the health financially. We establish a baseline for each of those areas in the business and then report annually against that baseline to track progress. That's the first step. And that is completely done. It's launched, and it's, it's rolling. The second part is a series of coaching sessions. There's, by the way, there's 160 videos video tutorials associated <laughs> with just that first part. Uh, the second part is the strategic planning unit, and that's mission, vision, organization chart, effectiveness areas, family employment policies, uh, position agreements, vetting the strategic plan to make sure it works economically and financially, um, and, and things like that. And what that is is a bunch of coaching videos uh, to help guide people through all those things. Essentially, it's the intent is to give the guidance to apply every single thing that we teach at the Ranching for Profit School. The third unit is the operating plan and essentially does the same thing for the annual operating plan with all these coaching videos. And the final unit is a procedures and policy manual. What's our drought policy? What's our marketing plan? And so on and so forth. 
right now it's just the baseline unit that's up and available. The other ones I'm working on, well, if I wasn't talking to you, I'd be working on it, um, which is actually a nice break. <laughs> so thank you for calling. Um, but uh, I'm working on that and expect to have the strategic plan done by the end of this year and the next two units done by next summer. Hmm. Uh, this is, but this is a program just for ranching for profit school alumni. So, uh, anyway, so other people might be interested in it, but you know, unless they know are grounded in the three secrets for increasing profit or the cell grazing principles and things like that, then some of this stuff may not make a lot of sense. No, it's really, really great, helpful, um, application of what you've already gathered through the Ranching for Profit School. How does that relate to the Executive Link program? Uh, Next Steps is part of the Executive Link program. When somebody's in Executive Link, they have complete access uh, and free access to Next Steps. Very good. Anything that we missed today, I really appreciate your time. No, it's a pleasure to talk to you again, and uh, I look forward to another conversation down the road. Yeah, we will definitely make that happen. Ranchingforprofit.com, that's uh, all spelled out, ranchingforprofit.com is probably the best place to go and and connect with uh, ranch management consultants. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And all their social media accounts are ranching the number four profit. So very, very easy to keep up with them there. And uh, I will link to all that in the show notes page and you'll be able to find it there at workingcows.net slash 41. Dave's previous episode on customer value was workingcows.net slash 13. So Dave, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it and really appreciate all you're doing for the ranching industry. Well, it's, uh, it's a great bunch of people we get to work with. And it's, uh, I don't suppose we'd do it if we weren't having fun doing it. So we're having a blast. (laughs) Good deal. Thanks for your time. All right. Take care. Coming up next week on the show, we have Cody Creelman. He is a veterinarian in Canada, and I'm excited to talk with him. He does some vlogging on YouTube and some podcasting. So we will see you next week for another episode of the Working Cows Podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.